I uh, grew up in Gainesville, Georgia, really at the, at the airport, and, and not because we travel a lot. My parents, that was their job. That was their business. They ran the Gainesville Airport, did flight training and charter and aircraft sales and that sort of thing. Um, and I grew up actually working at an early age. I still have scars on my knuckles from washing uh, landing gear, uh, especially in the winter when you can't, uh, when you can't feel your fingers. <laughs> But uh, so one of the perks, though, so one of the, the downside of growing up uh, on the airport was, was it was hard work, uh, lots of bugs and grease on those planes. Uh, the, the flip side, the good side of that, in fact, uh, my parents argued this is why they were paying me so little, is that I got to learn to fly for free. Uh, and so uh, I actually uh, flew uh, for the first time. I got my pilot's license before my driver's license. So on my 16th birthday, I soloed. Uh, which was really cool. Now, granted, the day after I went and got my driver's license because I wanted that too, which is different today. Have you re realized that? that kids don't want to drive? Anyway, doesn't matter. That's a whole other topic. But anyway, but here's the thing. So I had several different flight instructors, and my dad was certainly one of my flight instructors, and it was really a cool experience. And, and some of the things, my dad died now 21 years ago, so I think back on every, every memory I hold on deeply to. But as we were flying, my tendency was, do we have any pilots in the room by any chance? Well, my tendency was is to focus in on the instruments yes. and uh, specifically a heading indicator, which is essentially a compass uh, and the altimeter to make sure I wasn't going up or down. And as I was staring at the heading indicator, trying to make sure that I was going in the right direction, my dad would, would, would say, no, 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 look out, pick a dot on the horizon and just, just fly to that dot. Like, okay, that makes sense. And as I was doing that, I would still kind of be looking down and what unintentionally as I was flying, I would be gaining altitude and then I'd be losing altitude. He said, no, 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 stop that. Take a look at the panel, take a look at the horizon and just keep that distance the same. So head to that dot, keep that distance the same, you're gonna be fine. And there's been a lot of life lessons that over the past 21 years I've pulled from that conversation and from those instructions. But the thing that I leave you with today is it's really about focusing on the big picture. You know, we had uh, an election on May 22nd, and maybe I was your first choice, maybe I wasn't your first choice, but now we have two candidates left. And the big picture, the question before us is who is the best candidate to beat John Barrow in November? My name is, uh, I, I can't say it enough because I'm running for office, <laughs> David Bell Isle. I'm a sixth generation Georgian. Uh, I am a free market pro-life, Christian conservative. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a 21-year husband to an amazing wife. Uh, in fact, that just happened last week, the 21 years. I've got a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. I'm a business owner in Alpharetta, Georgia. Uh, I'm an attorney. And I am a product of Gainesville, Georgia, the poultry capital of the world, but I also have been, for the last seven years, the mayor of Alpharetta, the technology city of the South. And so, Everything that we have been looking to do in this campaign, and we've been running now for 15 months, but I will say that our campaign really just falls on two objectives, and they're born out of two things. One is a conviction, and one is a passion. And with respect to the conviction is I firmly believe, and I think many of you, if not all of you, believe this as well, is that the integrity of our state depends on the integrity of our elections. And then on the passion side, it's really about, I believe, and this really comes from my time as being mayor, I believe that whatever we do, we should be the best at it. And that creates the most opportunity, in it, whether it's a city or whether it's a state. So with that being said, everything that I'm about to say falls down to these two objectives, defeat voter fraud, champion Georgia jobs. And we can't say that enough. Now on the defeat voter fraud side, um, what I want to start out with talking about is something that's very recent. Uh, one of the big things that we've been talking about, we're all proud of the fact that you require and need a photo ID when you go to early vote, July 2nd. <laughs> uh, and we're also proud that you have to show your photo ID if you're like me and have to wait. I, I like to wait to Election Day. I, I don't like to celebrate Christmas early, and I don't like to celebrate Election Day early. So I just go vote on Election Day. But in either scenario, you show your photo ID. Your fingerprint. Well, your, your fingerprint's on the back of that card, but you don't have to give your fingerprint to vote. But, <laughs> but when you vote absentee ballot, you don't have to show a photo ID. You don't have to have a witness. You don't have to have a notary. You don't need an excuse. All you need is somebody's address 
in somebody's stamp. And really, across the country, the number one opportunity for voter fraud is through the absentee ballot process. If you don't believe that, all you have had to do is look at the news lately. Anyone see regarding the city of Atlanta, the mayor's race? Did you hear about that? So essentially, somebody is claiming, and look, it hasn't been fully investigated yet. Secretary of State's office is working on that. But essentially, there is a claim that 500 absentee ballots were used to try to differentiate, to change the outcome of the race. These absentee ballots were actually essentially in coordination with the Urban League is what has been claimed. Whether they filled those absentee ballots, that doesn't matter. The point is, is that when you look at opportunities for election fraud, whether it's vote harvesting, whether it involves a nursing home, more often than not, it's through that absentee ballot, and we have to close that gap. And so I'm advocating very hard to make sure that we can add that photo ID requirement to the absentee ballot. And for those of you who are looking for differentiating factors, my opponent does not believe that a photo ID requirement is necessary for the absentee ballot. Now, the second thing that we've been talking about is we, we recognize that only U.S. citizens should be able to vote in U.S. elections. My opponent says that a lot. I say it a lot, but here's what I mean by it, and here's what I want to do about it, and that also differentiates me. That in 2009, the Proof of Citizenship Act was passed by the state legislature. Fantastic. It does exactly what you would think it would do. It would require that a person prove that they are a U.S. citizen before they are allowed to vote in a Georgia election. However, we have not yet implemented that Proof of Citizenship Act. And the reason being is that we had the Obama administration, we had the Obama Department of Justice, the Secretary of State's office was working with that issue, but there was no cooperation. And so that saved database was not being able to be compatible, not being made available for us to use here in the state of Georgia. But now we have a president and President Trump who understands the importance of election integrity. And now is the time to get that Proof of Citizenship Act Implemented. Now, here's what that means. Until it's implemented, this is the problem. And a lot of people look at me, they, when they hear this, they get a little shocked, but it's true. That right now, in Georgia, you can vote in a Georgia election whether you are a U.S. citizen or not. Because when you get that voter registration form, if you get that physical form, in Block 5, you've got three choices. You can put your driver's license number down. If you don't have one, no problem. You put your social security number down in the middle. If you don't have one of those, no problem. Check the box on the far right that says, I have neither a driver's license number nor a social security number. Fill out the rest of the form, submit it. You will be registered to vote whether you are a U.S. citizen or not. And that needs to stop. And finally, you probably heard a lot about our voting technology. It is time to move to the vote. You know, this, these machines were ushered in under the area of Democrat, era of Democrat Secretary of State Kathy Cox. We have machines that are from 2002 operating on software from 2000. And here's the thing, and I don't know, I, I trust, I trust our, our, our system, but here's the thing. When you vote today and you hit that cast ballot, we have to, by faith, believe that our vote will be cast and counted just the way we've made it. There's no way to verify that. If there's a reason for a recount, if there's some issue or anomaly that makes you question the outcome of that election, there's really nothing we can do. And so what I want to do is champion a system that not only provides better voter security, but better voter confidence. And here's the system in terms of functionality that I'll champion as the next Secretary of State. Essentially, what I want to see is a system where after you show your photo ID, you would then be given a piece of paper. You would take that paper, you would submit it into the voting machine. You would vote electronically just like you do now. But when you hit cast ballot, two things would happen. One is it would make an electronic record of that vote just like we do today. The second thing is it would print out your selections onto that piece of paper so that you as the voter can visually verify that what you selected on the computer is represented on that piece of paper. You would then submit that piece of paper to a second machine, which would also do two things. It would make a scan of that visually verified paper, and it would also store that piece of paper. And in doing so, you would create two separate electronic records and one physical paper record. And with that, 
suddenly we've created redundancy, and usually we don't like redundancy, but when it comes to security and securing our votes, redundancy is a good thing. But you've created those two electronic records, which I would store on two separate closed circuit cyber secure databases, and we would also keep in a secure location those physical votes. And so if we had something that brought to our attention that we needed either a recount or we just needed to do a post-election audit to make sure that our procedures and processes are correct, we've got the capability of doing that. And here's the thing, the Democrats like to talk about voter suppression, and that makes sense, I understand it. You know, it sounds, when you hear them say it, okay, I get it, but you know the best way to defeat voter suppression? It's to defeat voter fraud. <laughs> because what suppresses the vote more than someone believing that it's not a fair process? Especially when it comes to Republicans. When Republicans don't believe the process is fair, take Atlanta, for example. How likely are they going to vote? Look, if, if they're going to cheat us out of the victory every single time, why am I going to vote? So the best way to defeat voter suppression is to defeat voter fraud. And that's what our plan has been about, is defeating voter fraud by implementing the Proof of Citizenship Act, bringing a photo ID requirement to the absentee ballot, and ushering in the next generation of voting technology to make sure that our elections are secure. So that falls within the direct responsibility side of the Secretary of State's office, but for a moment, I wanna put on my mayor's hat because I've never been satisfied with the direct responsibility side alone. And here's the thing, here's the, the joy, part of my joy of being mayor is that there were two sides to that job. There was the direct responsibility side, and you guys are familiar with those tasks. It's public safety, it's engineering and public works, it's parks and rec, it's zoning, it's the budget process. All those are within the direct responsibility side. And we did it well in Alpharetta. One of two AAA rated cities in the state, one of the lowest effective tax rates anywhere in the state of Georgia. We lowered taxes four times under my watch. But here's the thing, we did it well, which provided us an opportunity to pivot and cast a vision, point to a dot on a horizon and take us where we needed to go. And so the other side of our initiatives with the Secretary of State's office is championing Georgia jobs. Now here's the thing, we know that we're the number, for five years in a row, we're the number one state to do business in. We are and should be, and rightfully so, proud of that distinction. But we also know that when you get outside Metro Atlanta, it's a different story. And if you, I don't, maybe some of you in your work and in your travels, you, you're around all the state of Georgia on a regular basis. I'll be honest with you, but for this campaign for the last 15 months, that's not been my practice. I usually just kind of, I'm in Alpharetta, maybe I'll go to Atlanta or I'll go to Versailles, I'll go to different areas. But the entire state of Georgia is a very large state and it has a very different story. And so when I meet with mayors and I meet with community leaders, you start hearing about these industries that are gone. They're down to their last industry. They're down to their last large employer. When you look at these downtowns that were built really during a different era, suddenly you just kind of see and you would want what I would want, which is like, gosh, how do we help them? How do we preserve small town Georgia? How do we create a success story beyond Metro Atlanta for the state of Georgia? That's what's going through my mind, especially as a mayor. And it's a question, well, what can you do? You know, especially as a, as a, as a Secretary of State candidate, what can you do? And then you hear, the, uh, the statistics that kind of make it and drive it all that much more home, which is that they're predict predicting that within the next 12 years, 85 of the 159 counties in the state of Georgia are predicted to lose both jobs and population. I was uh, in a group uh, in Southeast Georgia and it's called, it was called the Liars Club now, which is funny that they would invite a politician to a group called the Liars Club. I couldn't figure that out. But anyway, so, I, so I'm there as, at the Liars Club. And, but they're talking about, look, it said, look, our best and our brightest, you know, our young kids, they, they grow up and then they leave. And, and like, rightly so, because they're looking for better opportunities. And so the question is, what really can the Secretary of State do about that? Well, I'll tell you, when we look at what, what we do best, I do think there's an opportunity from a leadership platform 
to create not only better opportunities within Metro Atlanta, but also throughout the state of Georgia. And so what I want to look at doing is just like we did in Alpharetta in terms of building up our key, key industry. When we started picking that dot on the horizon, we, when we started charting our course to where we wanted to be, to who we wanted to be, I recognized real early that I didn't have the authority to do it. <laughs> Mayors don't have so much authority, not as much as it sounds. And I also knew that we wouldn't have the resources to get there. And so what we were able to do is, you know, we, well, look, we want to be the technology city of the South. We want to have a strength and grow that strength. How do we do that? We started inviting the best CEOs, the best CIOs, the best CTOs in our city. And we said, look, how do we create a better environment for startup technology companies? How do we create a better community among the technology companies? How do we grow what we do here in Alpharetta? And with their help, we created the state's first technology commission we were able to land a technical college for workforce development. We were able to launch a technology incubator, which now serves 50 startup technology companies. We launched a conference center so that these, those kind of key southeastern United States, those key events for technology could happen in Alpharetta. And here's the thing, it worked. <laughs> we grew Alpharetta to over 640 technology companies, to over 100 thousand jobs. And so when I look out at the state of Georgia, what Georgia does best, it's agriculture, it's technology, and it's logistics. But when you look at agriculture, this is the disturbing fact. Well, the good news is that it's the biggest industry in the state of Georgia. It's 75 billion a year. Is that number close? I'm close. I may not be that. 75 billion a year. Yet the average farmer is 60 years old. Think about that for a moment. The average farmer is five years away from traditional retirement. No other industry is like that. So what do we do about that? How do we change that? And for many places in Georgia, that's their key industry. Sometimes because they're good at it, sometimes it's because it's all, their, all that's left. And then technology, you know, we, I just told you about our story in Alpharetta with technology. But as a state, it's one of the things we do best. But the future of technology is going to depend on our ability to attract innovation or investment or venture capital dollars from the private markets into our new ideas, into our new innovations, into our new technology companies. Now, here's the disturbing figures. Across the country, investment dollars and in new technologies, 75% of them, 75% of all invested dollars in technology go to three very blue states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. Georgia's share is just 2% of what California gets alone. Think about that for a minute. And so how do we change that? And certainly, how would you even do that from the Secretary of State's office? And then there's logistics. Forbes magazine says that, you know, 1.4 million new workers are needed this year in the field of logistics. And I think about, wait a minute, there might be some opportunity there for Georgia. And so here's what I want to say with respect to that. When it comes to agriculture, one of the things I think that we need to look at is how do we remove duplicative regulation? We have federal uh, regulations. We have state federal regulations, especially when it comes to environmental. We need to take a serious look at that. But in terms of growing agriculture, in terms of making and bringing a younger farmer to the table, a younger families to the table on this, I think the opportunity lies in being the number one state in ag tech. And I think there's an opportunity. You blend two things that we do well together. I think in precision ag and biotech, there's different ways that we can grow that. And here's the thing, I'm not just talking about it. We actually commenced and started before I ran, uh, before I left the mayor's office, the state's first ag tech conference is gonna take place in Alpharetta next month. We've been in, in cooperation with Gary Black and the Department of Agriculture, different technology and agriculture companies, both in Georgia and in the Southeast. It's a start. And I think that's the start that we need to do. If we're going to start growing what we do best, if we're going to start being the best at agriculture and getting a younger family there, then we need to start blending that with technology. And that is a space that we can own as the state of Georgia. And when it comes to technology, how are we going to do that? What I want to do is start linking together these different innovation centers and technology incubators across Metro Atlanta and the state of Georgia and start identifying the best players in health IT and in information security and in fintech and ag tech and start finding ways to promote these companies. Everyone's familiar with our current energy secretary, Rick Perry, former governor of Texas. He was famous for selling Texas to Californians. <laughs> 
And here's the thing. When it comes to Georgia, we have a lower tax burden. We have a lower cost of living. We have a better quality of life. We don't have to overtake California, Massachusetts, and New York in year one, but we can do a heck of a lot better than just 2% of what California gets. I also believe in the field of logistics. You've got two ports. We've got the busiest airport in the world. We're home to UPS. We're home to Delta. We have so much going for us. If we focus our efforts on this, we can truly create opportunity outside Metro Atlanta and also in. But those are jobs that involve engineering, robotics, and different professional and expertise that can really help our state. So here's the thing. In light of those, so that's, that, that's what we're looking to do is defeat voter fraud, champion Georgia jobs. You've heard about my plan to do it, but the, the, the problem before us right now is a much more immediate problem because one of two candidates is going to face John Barrow in November. And the question is, that big picture question is, who is the best candidate to face John Barrow? Now, John Barrow, for those of you who don't recall, former congressman and had a district between Athens and Augusta. He's an attorney. He has being able to create a reputation, although I will say undeserved reputation, of being a moderate Democrat. Yet he voted with Obama 95% of the time. He's going to be able to attract funding not only within the state of Georgia, but if you've heard of the Soros Project, the George Soros Project, where they would fund Democratic Secretary of State candidates, that's what's at stake here. And here's the thing. He's looking to, and it's already been talking about, how do we redraw every state and federal district line in the state of Georgia. Now, we've all heard and worried a little bit. Are we a state that's turning purple? Are we a state that one day will be blue? You know the fastest way to get there? Redraw the lines. <laughs> and right now, what he wants to do is take the decision process on those lines away from elected officials, a group for which you and I have recourse with, and put them into the hands of the appointed, a group we don't have recourse with. And here's the thing, too. What he knows as an attorney, and I'm an attorney, I know this, too, is that if some group sues the Secretary of State's office, and the Secretary of State's office is on the front lines when it comes to litigation over election issues, when somebody sues the Secretary of State's office, and if you think it doesn't happen, it does, in fact, it's happening right now. Eric Holder, former U.S. Attorney General under Obama, has sued the state of Georgia regarding district lines of two state house districts. If he agrees with that, do you know what he has to do? Do you know all, what he has to do? All he has to do is take that complaint, which has allegations in that complaint, which you and I would say that's ridiculous. But he may not. If he sticks that complaint in a drawer for 30 days... After 30 days, you and I, as the citizens of Georgia, will have admitted every allegation in that complaint. We cannot afford to have John Barrow as our next Secretary of State if we want to continue to practice conservative values and conservative leadership. And it's going to take a plan not only to be able to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, not only to have the legal expertise to know what he's saying and what it actually means, we've got to have a plan that is bigger than simply elections. When you look at those state maps, when you look at the U.S. maps after a presidential election, after a governor election, have you seen those maps? They're red, right, everywhere, except the cities. You can find the cities on a map that has no markings just by looking at the blue concentrations. And I tell you that to point out something, is that we're not going to be able to debate ourselves or to reason ourselves to a more conservative Georgia. I hate to say it. Even if we have the best arguments, which we do, even if we have more arguments, which we do, the problem is this, is that you cannot change someone's heart with your mind. The way you change someone's heart is with experience, their experience. And so I tell you that to point out this. So when you look at Fulton County, we all know Fulton County is a blue county. But when you look at it precinct by precinct, it is blue almost entirely until you get to the top of the county. And at the top of the county is a red dot. And we call that red dot Alpharetta. And the reason that dot is red is because the people that live there have seen conservatism. They've seen conservative leadership applied and it has created a tremendous level of opportunity, a tremendous level of prosperity that is unprecedented. And that's the way you fight a Democrat, is you change their experience. You can't debate them there. 
but you can change the experience to where they say, you know what, that's working for me. That's working for my family, and that's what's at stake. And so I do present myself. I ask for your help, for your support, because I do believe that I'm the very best candidate to beat John Barrow in November. But to do that, to defeat voter fraud, to champion Georgia jobs, to defeat John Barrow in November, I absolutely, I humbly need your help. Because I'm running against a candidate right now who, during the election, ran on things that we can't do. He ran on a platform of defeating sex trafficking, opioid crisis, money laundering, all great things that need to be addressed. It's just not the job of the Secretary of State. And here's the thing. Over the past six years, my opponent has run for three different political offices. He's put 1.2 million of his own money chasing those three political offices and he's yet to finish one of the jobs. He has pledged to bring that 1.2 million up to $2 million. But here's the thing, and I want you to have this question in your mind. If he sought three different political offices in six years and he put 1.2 million of his own money, he's gonna put 2 million in there. Two years from now, during the next presidential election, when we need stability more than ever at the Secretary of State's office, if a U.S. Senate seat opens up, and it might, does he stay at the Secretary of State's office, or does he chase just the next rung up the ladder? I need your help. I need your vote. If what you heard today resonated with you, I would love for you to sign up. Jamie is here. Would love for you to sign up so we could stay in contact with you. Would love for you to take a sign would love for you to either through your emails or through your social media to say, I'm endorsing David Bell Isle for Secretary of State. And the word endorsing is very important. We would love your endorsement. We would love your support. We're here to earn it. David Bell Isle, I'm here to defeat voter fraud, champion Georgia jobs, and defeat John Barrow in November. Thank you so much. Well, the, the provisional ballots, they are they're kind of put off, essentially put in a holding pattern. I do believe that if there's enough provisional ballots to be within the margin, they're going to take a, a tough and, and, and solid look at that. Generally speaking, there are not a significant percentage of, of provisional ballots. But, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about the change in the election process from the machines and so forth. If you run the cost, uh, how much is that going to cost? Yeah, it's not, it's not free. Um, to be, be honest with you, I think not only do we need to get the capital, and we'll have to lobby the, uh, the state legislatures to do, legislators to do this, but not only will we need the capital to uh, produce those machines or to purchase those machines, I think we need to be in the habit and the practice of putting money aside for you know, what's next. You know, 10 years from now, eight years from now, whatever. You know, as, as mayor, we never just bought a capital asset and assumed that was the end of it. <laughs> we're always, if we bought a fire truck, and fire trucks are expensive, by the way, if you want a million dollar vehicle, it'll put a Ferrari to shame in terms of price. But if, if we buy a million dollar asset, we know that one day we're going to need something to replace that fire truck. And so we govern our finances in such a way and provide those finances in such a way that when the light, useful life of that fire truck has expired and passed, that we're ready to buy the next one. I think we need to do the same thing. But in answer to your question, the machines are going to cost about $115, $120 million. But in light of a $22 billion, $24 billion state budget, and in light of the fact that I believe the integrity of our state depends on the integrity of our elections, I think it's money well spent. So, David, what yes, process sir. would you use to uh, use a photo ID to get an absentee ballot? I mean, you can... Yeah. How would you do that? That's a great, great question. So the absentee ballot process is a two-step process. There's the, there's the application side of it, and then there's the actual ballot itself. Right now, really anyone can request an absentee ballot for anybody, and that's the problem. So what I would propose is during that application process that you present some proof of who you are, a scan of that photo ID that's already, you know, we have a list of photo IDs that are, are uh, sufficient. Uh, so a scan of one of those documents, I think, would be the best solution. That's the solution I'd be pushing for, and it would be submitted with the application. Submitted to the uh, election office of each county? That's right. That's right. Have you talked to the counties about that? <laughs> we'll, we'll be glad to have those conversations in January. <laughs>